David, welcome to the show, and we get to do it in sunny Dubai. Absolutely buzzing to be here, mate, so thanks for the, the invitation, and yeah, sunny Dubai, it's getting warm outside now, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure, and I really think the time that I've got to spend with you last trip, and then even the 30 minutes we're chatting before, I think there's a side to you that people get to see a little bit of on Instagram, but there's more depth to what we get to cover, so a longer podcast opens yeah. up to that. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, you know, being in certain environments can produce certain conversations, and I like getting into the nitty gritty and, you know, really having those deep conversations, but, you know, it's about the environment you need to be in, you know, initially. To I think Dubai's that. that space, though. For, for you in particular, I think it's been like even another opportunity for you to level up. Yeah, of course. And one of the factors that's made me relocate here was the opportunities obviously i've created a you know i've started a real estate company over here as well that being the driving factor but you know always wanting to you know come and live here has always been something that i've looked at because it's just a completely different environment in terms of the culture you know the security the safeness of it um everything's just you know a level above anywhere else especially the, the uk which in the trajectory it's on i, I completely agree and it reminds me of a phrase that actually Mackenzie, our mutual friend, has been smashing yep. out here. He said yesterday, the power's in the proximity. So you're talking yep. there about the environment, the conversations you get to have. And it's almost like I thought you were operating at a high level and when you were based purely in Scotland, like DX and everything we'll speak about is a testament to that. Mm -hmm. But then when you come out here, it's just up and up and up and up. It's David 2.0. Listen, of course, and one of the, the things for me as well, and I quickly realised, you know, like, you know, I would say, you know, back home in the UK, in Glasgow, where I'm from and my businesses, and I'm like, okay, it was pretty successful. I would, of course, say that. Uh, but when you come here, it humbles you, which, you know, there's two ways to look at that. The way that I look at that is it's just more motivational. You know, it's in, this is such an inspiring place to live in terms of getting to that next trajectory, in terms of getting to that next part of, you know, business, which is, you know, fast approaching eight figures, which is where we want to get to. So for me, it's been, yeah, it's been challenging in, in terms of, you know, relocating to another country, setting up a business. There's a lot of challenges involved in that. Of course there is. But yeah, it's definitely been so beneficial in terms of even my network now, like the, the people that I've came across or, you know, those, those conversations that you have you don't have that in my opinion anywhere else in the world yeah it's an amazing place from that perspective but things could be very different i heard that you wanted to join the army when you were younger <laughs> you've been doing your research <laughs> i promise i've got a few things up my sleeve but yeah <laughs> that that was an interesting ambition when you were a teenager hi so basically what happened was when i was leaving school me and my mate martin um we were like so set and go to join the army so we'd went into the careers office in, you know, in Glasgow City Centre, went in, just, you know, wanted to go and join the army and essentially make money. In terms of making money, I, th I thought that was going to be making money back then, but we can get, get into that. So again, went in the careers office, you know, I was going to be going into the Royal Engineer Corps. That was my chosen, you know, kind of category as such. And um, went through the process, which was, you know, very interesting to say the least. Obviously, there's a lot of fitness, um, you know, tests and challenges to get through the, the, the process, which back then I was, you know, fit as fuck, so it wasn't an issue. And then we go to one of the final parts of, like, the, the process as such would be you go to Edinburgh for two days and you do, like, a... Well, I, don't, I don't know what the second is because, you know, we'll come to that in a second. But basically it was, like, a, a full medical day one and then day two would be challenges and you know selection process and whatever else comes along that way so we i got to edinburgh very early in the morning it was like maybe you know seven eight o'clock in the morning really really early i remember coming off the train and thinking to myself well, this is pretty real you know and you know we've been told to meet at a certain checkpoint it was very regimented very early on so it made you feel like almost part of the army already basically right so we get to edinburgh um, I get to the, the, the meeting point, the, the coach pulls up. Now, there's people there from Blackpool, Newcastle, all over the UK. So we get on the coach, that's fine, up to the base, up to the barracks, you know, go and check in. We literally, like, I remember going up the stairs and they were like, oh, the bedrooms are through there. So didn't know what to expect, but it was just a big hall with just beds. Just bunks. Rows and basically just rows of what looked like bunks, right? So I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, but listen, it's the army. What do you, what do you expect? You're not going to get, you know, five-star luxury, I suppose. So got my stuff all organised. You know, somebody comes in straight away, you know, shouting and bawling, blah, blah, blah. It was quite intense. And then straight down into the medical hall. 
um, through that selection process. Different parts of your body getting tested and she, like literally they scrutinise everything. So then I get to, you know, this one room, there's three doctors in it. So I'm just, you know, sitting there having a chat with them. This was maybe three or four hours into the, 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 the medical essentially, right? And then very quickly realised something was wrong. Very, very quickly realised that something was wrong because I was like, I didn't see three doctors in here with anybody else. So there's a challenge, or not a challenge, but there's a, a medical test called peak flow. You, you might have heard of it. It's yeah. like the tube, you blow on it and you get a certain reading. I was diagnosed asthmatic late when I was like 19 and that was one of the tests. One of the tests that they done, right? So now bear in mind, fit as a fiddle, flew by all the, you know, running challenges, the fitness challenges, whatever you want to call it. And then this peak flow, they're like, okay, you need to get a certain reading. I think off the top of my head, it was about 350 that I had to score, something like that, 300, 350, whatever that means in science terms. It's not relevant, but it's yeah, not, you, it's you not, knew what the number it's was. It's not relevant, but I think off the top of my head, that's what the number was. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing this chat, I'm doing this, you know, peak flow, and the guy's like, look, listen, pull me to the side for the other two doctors, and he's like, well, this is super important. You know, you need to get X amount to get to the next stage, blah, blah, blah. So I started to freak out. I'm 16, so I'm like, what do you mean? Like, never been questioned on my fitness in my life. And I'm like, it's just a, a fucking tube. <laughs> like, yeah, at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, couldn't get it. Couldn't get it. So maybe half an hour passed. Um, and obviously they gave me multiple attempts, probably more attempts than what they probably should have, right? So, yeah, they basically just says, look, go back out and wait in the little reception bit. That was fine, cool. And then this doctor's appeared with a brown envelope and a train ticket. So I knew at that point, something's wrong. Why the fuck have they got a train ticket and what's in the envelope? So the envelope just basically specified that I'd failed my medical based on the lung capacity within my body, which I found very strange because, like I says to you, at the time, I'd been very fit. You know, I played football three, four, five times a week. So that was a big shock to me. But again, it just goes to show you the scrutiny and what they actually do. And then for me, that changed everything because they suspended me applying for the army for 12 months. So here I am sitting on a train back from Edinburgh to Glasgow, phone my dad, says, you need to come pick me up. <laughs> and that was it. Fucking army life That initial gone. ambition gone. Yeah, army life gone. My mate flew by it, passed it. And I think he only actually left the army a couple of years ago. Um, he had been re relocated to um, Northern Ireland essentially as well so yeah I think he has he had a military career yeah he basically and I think he's not long left so yeah listen good on him he's obviously got a completely different life and so they are essentially we as all well. go in different paths so, after certain road plots come up you have to pivot and yeah. things happen faster than others and I know you ended up in, in retail of all places yeah so I mean you know at that point in time I'd left school it was probably around about the you know September October time Right, um, so obviously I've went to go and join the army. No fucking job. So my parents are like, "What are you gonna do?" And I was like, "Well, I better put together a, a fucking CV." <laughs> so put together a CV, and sure enough, you know, I done what most people that age probably done, into the town, you know, looking for Christmas jobs. Here's my CV, boom, boom, boom. So I must have handed it about fifty, and then I got a phone call from JD Sports. So offered me an interview, went through the interview, it was really good, got the job, again, Christmas temp job, and then we'll review it in kind of, you know, February, March, see where you go, okay, cool, that's fine, and then I loved it, like it was my first job, like, you know, I was, I think at the time, right, I can't remember, I was like maybe three pounds something an hour, three pounds, yeah, minimum 80. wage for a 17 year old would have been... <laughs> buttons right but I remember I think I was clearing maybe I don't know between 150 and 180 a week something like that because I worked a lot like I just seen the money and I was like oh I just work and work and work and work and you know like I've always been a saver not now but we can get into that but I was always a saver back then so I used to always just save my wages up be pure tight and not spend money like and then I'd go and treat myself in a pair of jeans or you know a pair of gazelles or whatever it yeah, was back then. you went towards something. Basically. And then what happened was, again, Christmas temp job, we're not keeping you on, see you later. So I'm back to the drawing board. So obviously I had a little bit of experience under my belt now. So again, added that onto the CV and away I went again. And then I worked in River Island. I fucking hated that job. I hated it. It wasn't was, the same environment as you had the JD? Nah, it was like, I was kind of looked down on. A young boy, like, I kind of look young for my age. 
back then, for I looked young, young, you know, so I was kind of getting looked down on and it was a, a different environment, like the shifts were shit, it was like 6 in the morning to 10 in the morning, like it was just pure dog shit, man, right, like, but, you know, you need to do what you need to do to get some money and at the end of the day, that's always been my, my mentality. So, left there and then went to work at McDonald's. So, that was where I went next, which was interesting and I loved it. Like, I always say to Again, people, you felt you could apply yourself somewhere? Yeah, mate, I always say, like, I loved working at McDonald's. I don't know why, right? Because it's got a stigma. It's got a perception. Everybody's, you know, fast food workers or fucking McDonald's, this or that. But see, at the end of the day, like, how many young people has that probably helped get a job, get money, get themselves on the ladder? They offer really good career and progression opportunities. Like, within maybe, you know, three or four months of being there as a crew member, I got promoted to what was called a crew trainer. Now, very early on, that then started to cause a little bit of, you know upheaval friction and the staff that were already there because they're like he's just in the door how's he been promoted i've been here for two years fucking been doing the same job blah 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 so in a sense i was like people are starting to get you know jealous in my work ethic and seeing what i was doing and stuff like that and then you know i was going through the management side of things and then you know um i had a little bit of a a, a challenge that had to place and you told me this before because it's it's, a, it's very in line with your character in some ways, yeah. but it's also really surprising that they culturally didn't understand what had happened. That was the biggest thing for me, right? was not understanding that I was trying to protect another female member of staff from somebody that was, you know, verbally abusing her and, you know, making her, you know, physically cry. How would you explain the situation then? Fuck it. Do we just go into it? Like, yeah, just let's go real? Let's fucking do it. So essentially I was on night shift. Um, because you used to get an extra fifty p an hour, <laughs> right? So I was on, I was on, uh, I was on night shift working at McDonald's, and you know those big banners that they put up in the car park, and it'll be like advertising maybe the latest promo or whatever. So I was out putting one of them up, right? But I seen that as a little bit of an opportunity to sky. Of course, it was out in the car park, nobody's bothering me, whatever else. So you cable tying it on and whatever else. So I've turned round, and you know the the assistant manager at the time was there. Now, that was strange because the store manager and the assistant manager, they would never walk by 7 o'clock, maybe half 7, 8 o'clock, right? But they wouldn't be in, in, in store at maybe, you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night. As you go into the night shift. As you go into the night shift. So I'm like, oh, hi, Michelle, how's things? Blah, blah. She's like, oh, see, when you finish that, can you come in and see me? So I was like, of course. So I was like, oh, something's happened or they want me to look after the safe tonight and do the cashing up and blah, blah, blah. So... Went into the office after I'd put the fucking banner up and it, it, I'll just name her as, as a woman called Naomi and Michelle there. So I'm like, what's going on? Doors closed I'm in the office and I'm looking and I'm like, guys, everything all right? Uh, yeah, it's just to let you know that we're going to have to suspend you. So straight away, I knew what it was about. The previous night on night shift, this uh, character should be call it for a nicer phrase, right? Had come into the store and they'd only just opened the store to work, uh, to, to operate 24 hours. drive through was always 24 hours, but they'd just opened the store. Now, the location of the store, in my opinion, you should never have been 24 hours without security for this. Well, let's let's think about the Four Corners in Glasgow or uh, when I've been in Manchester at Piccadilly. Yeah. They've got bouncers on the door of these places. Exactly. From midnight through till the morning because people are coming after nightclubs or they're wandering around from particular areas using all sorts of substances before. Exactly. And people are coming in, mate. And this guy was out his face, like genuinely out his face. So basically I'm sitting on my break. Now, when you're on your break at McDonald's, you need to, you know, put something over your your, your uniform, essentially. So I had my hoodie on, just sitting in the restaurant, you know, having food. And this, I seen this guy coming in, and I'm like, I knew this guy's going to be problematic. He was out his face, just banging into things and whatever else. He's got the desk. One thing's led to another. He starts verbally abusing the manager on shift, right? To the point where she's actually, you know, getting scared and crying. So I've got him a fucking seat approached him and says look mate stop fucking shouting at her right get out the fucking store like you're not getting served blah 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 then obviously what happens he starts shouting back for backwards and forwards at myself right so i mean no violence took place let me just put that on the record but i was like obviously giving him it back like get out the fucking shop blah, blah, you blah. have to meet the energy with the right energy otherwise the situation might end up worse 
Of course, and listen, I'm a young boy back then, like, what young boy is going to stand there and let, well, the way that I've been brought up, I can't let somebody speak to a female like that, especially in public, right? So it was something that I just, you know, jumped jump straight into the situation, thought I was defending my manager at the time. Anyway, guys left, whatever else. So I said to the manager on shift, look, go in the back, go into half an hour, I'll come back my break early, I'll clock back in, I'll look after things, go and get something to eat and chill out. No worry, thanks, blah, 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 blah. So then, obviously, if we go back to, you know, me going into the office to the stand room, and I'm like, you're suspending me? What the fuck for? And they're like, yeah, you were swearing at a customer. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, right? So I'm like, sorry? Yeah, yeah, you were swearing at a customer. So I've just looked at the manager. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Well, I mean, you were, you know, shouting and swearing at the guy and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, he was verbally abusing you to the point where you were standing there crying and tears and shaking. What do you want me to do? Just sit there and fucking allow that to happen? So, yeah, disciplinary action, blah, blah, blah. I end up just resigning before probably I got the bullet, yep. right? Because that's what was probably going to fucking happen. So it was a complete fucking stitch up in my eyes. But looking back on it and looking back on everything that happened, like I didn't join the army for a reason. You know, it didn't get, you know, kept on in JD for a reason. That has happened for a reason. And then, you know, when I left there, like, listen, McDonald's was great. I loved it. You know, it, it let me buy my first car outright. Three grand, we Corsa, you know, black Corsa. Good memories from that great memories and I liked all the people that worked in there they were all young and I actually had a good time you know I learned a lot about myself in there in terms of you know be, being able to mature being able to handle working environments training programs and you know from a, a business perspective looking back now I wasn't thinking about that then I was just seeing it as a job but I did I really enjoyed it and I always say that so yeah let me buy my first car outright and then obviously that happened. So I was like, okay, well, what the fuck am I going to do now? Because now I'm a young boy and I've got bills to pay. So uh, I went from there and I went to work in Sky. This is one of the areas that I think is interesting because when we went for dinner last time we were here, uh, Ling Ling of all places, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Amazing you place. just were like, oh, people don't realise like how much I got from working in a big corporate because a lot of people see the entrepreneur now and they yep. assume like, oh, shun the, shun the corporate world. Like that's bullshit. Like, run your own business and that's that's cool but it's also not always that helpful because most people have to work their way through the corporate ladder and sometimes might stay in it forever and there's ways to find mm -hmm. fulfillment in that like cards on the table i'm still in a corporate role that i thoroughly enjoy it allows me to yep. build what i'm building and mm -hmm. enjoy myself and fiscally reward myself yep. and find fulfillment is it something i'll be in forever probably not but when you talk about sky you almost speak quite fondly of it too again mate it's another job that i loved not towards the end but we can get into that but, you know, from the very early stages, you know, like, just even the setup, right? And, by the way, the setup is stuff that I've implemented in some of my businesses today. So, excuse me, like, when I first joined Sky, you go into a four-week academy, it's called. Four-week training program. So, before you even get on the phone, they're investing into you as a person for four full weeks. They've obviously got a full training program. They don't get me wrong, after, you know... I'm a very switched on boy at that age, right? I'm like, this is going to just get me on the phone. Like, that was my eagerness, right? But anyway, went through the, the, the training academy and then you go on the phone and then you've got all this support round about you. And I can always remember the first day I went on the phone, everybody's like, oh my God, you're going on the phone, what's going to happen? But seeing you, you strip it back, you're just having a conversation with somebody. That's all it is, right? So I thoroughly enjoyed working there. And then, you know, as an employee, you got a lot of benefits as well. Like, you know, free Sky TV. Like, that for me, like, obviously I was living with my mum at the time. So she was buzzing because yeah. she was, like, saving 150 quid a month result. <laughs> you know, I was getting multi-screen, you know, a box in my room, a box in her room. I didn't, you know, I didn't have that as a as a kid growing up. So um, it was... There was benefit from that perspective. There was perspective. a lot of benefits. The training part's what interests me because we'll go on to speak about how you treat your staff at DX and how important that is for retention yep. and growth. Mm -hmm. But when you think back to how you felt in Sky, you probably felt more confident going on the phone because you'd had this backing and support early on to give you a chance to be good on the phone. Essentially. And you, 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 you kind of done some reps before you got thrust into the live environment. Of course. And like, I'm a big believer and you need to set people up for success. And that's exactly what Sky do. They, they, they breed you through a training program. And by the way, like, they'll not miss much if they missed anything at all, right? But if you look at it from a business owner perspective just now, I'm like, okay, cool. What they're doing is, as I says, they're investing into those people for four weeks. There's a trainer. There's, you know, other 
you know, employees coming in and doing presentations and doing talks and sharing hints and tips because the job essentially, it could be quite stressful at times because essentially it was our attentions department. So it's a cancellation department, right? So you're getting every, <laughs> you're getting all people for all walks of life phoning to cancel your their fucking subscription. Like you're their last point of contact, right? And that these people could be through multiple problems, multiple challenges. But I always say my favourite type of calls were fucking just cancel my fucking sky. I don't even want to fucking speak to you. Blah blah blah. Somebody's riled up, riled up, and I'm like, okay, no problem. I can do that for you. But I would like to know why. And it was just, you know, sometimes that didn't work. Of course, it would be like, don't fucking speak to me, cancel my sky. So obviously we've got, you know, if they say a word so many times, you you have to, to action Rule that. of three is a good one. If you get three objections and you yeah. can't handle all three of them, it's time to it's, be polite it's, and it's move on. time to be polite and move on. But, you know, I would probably say about, you know, 80% of those calls, yeah, I'd probably saved them, maybe upgraded them, got my new package because I liked breaking down those barriers. And see now when I think about that, that's what, you know, sales is breaking down those barriers, finding, you know, solutions to people's problems and, you know, having that adaptability because that's what, you know, Sky taught me. Every single time I answered the phone, although it could be the same thing, it was a different perspective, it was a different call, it was a different person at the other end of that line. People, you know, majority of them, you know, just had financial problems, like can't afford it, maybe they had a discount, it was expiring people play the game oh I've, I've got you know I can't afford this now I'm like oh yeah your offer's just coming to an end let me see if I can get you another one of course those were probably the most easier calls right because you know people are just looking they for want an to offer stay, they want to save yeah it. essentially um, but just throughout my time there you know I met some great people fr- people that I'm really really close friends with now um, people that still actually work there believe it or not but listen they, you know they, they enjoy it as well like you says like they built a career there's a lot of people that, you know, when you work for these organisations, they offer you that ladder. They offer you that pathway. Now, if, I reckon if I stayed there, of course, I would probably have worked my way up the ladder. That's what I was doing prior to leaving. That's what I've tried to do anywhere I've went. But, you know, I was getting to that age where I was like, you know, I, I want my own business, you know. But nobody in my family had any business experience. Nobody really round about me had a business. If anybody I knew, you know, or, or it was like for a mutual had a business, it was a big thing or they've got their own company. And, you know, that's the, the, the perception. So, but one of the things that I did that kind of set me up for my business, you know, life, I suppose, was Sky used to have something called ShareSave. I don't know if they still have it, right? fantastic scheme and opportunity so you as an employee could buy into a share save scheme and it would be like a three-year maturity so obviously the first three years you would just be paying in paying in paying in but then after that you'd be getting a payout every single year providing you you kept doing it right and then during that period of time sky was getting bought over so people were like in call centers were only like a good five figures payout which is you know for people life-changing money Right, so what I done with my money was obviously when I was leaving, and I was like, um, if that came out, and I was like, oh, all of a sudden I'll just go part time, <laughs> so that I could still remain an employee, right? So part time, still get the same benefits, just different shifts, but that allowed me to go and do a gas engineer course because I'm a gas engineer to trade. It opened up time, and you had the fiscal capability to invest in something that was the next move, yeah, and the next move that definitely started to lean into the more of the entrepreneur David that we see now because exactly. I believe at the time your ambition was to own a gas engineering business. But of course, you have to gain your stripes and you have to go and work as a gas engineer for a company first. Exactly. And that I find that fascinating that the way your mindset was at that point in time, there's a level of maturity where you were like, this five figure payout, let me invest that in a training course, which is Mm going to upskill me for the future. And that's the way I looked at it. But I would probably say 99% of other people my age, they probably went and fucked it probably went out and bought clothes, went holidays, maybe got a new car, whatever else. Whereas for me, I'm like, I seen that as a, you know, an opportunity. So I was like, I'm going to take that money and then I'm going to invest it in myself. Now, I didn't really like school. So when I was like, going, I didn't really see it. When I look back now, obviously it's investing in my own education. I didn't see it like that then. I just thought, well, I could go and use this money, go and do a fast track gas engineering course, right? And then I can go and work for somebody for a few years and then I can go and have my own gas company. That was my mentality. So that's what I'd done. So I took the money. Obviously, 
you know, when I was doing the course, you don't get paid for six months. That's why I still work part time, and I eventually end up chucking it when, you know, it just got a bit much or whatever else. Um, and I always had enough saved up to get me by for those six months and beyond because I didn't expect to finish on you know six months and walk straight into a job. It took me like three or four months to get a job. But what I done during that period of time was I was offering my services to companies for free. I was going and getting trial shifts. I was gaining a bit more knowledge because in six months, there's only so much you can learn. There's a reason that there's a four-year apprenticeship program for that, right? But again, I, I had an opportunity to not bypass that, but just get a bit... Fast-tracked. Fast Fast-tracked, right? In terms of your gas engineer career, I want to fast-forward to the lockdowns when you were working like a dog. What was life like then? Fucking brutal. <laughs> Genuinely, mate, it was brutal. So... Uh, I've spoken about this previously as well. So because I was, you know, single, young and fit, lived on my own, you know, I was deemed as your, you know, ultimately low risk, essentially. Low risk for the pandemic, yeah. Low risk for the, the pandemic, which you know, we all now know is a fucking shit show, right? So at the start, it was great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, it was it was okay. It was it, maybe not great. It was, it was good at the start, right? Because, you know, I was kept busy. I'm not the type of person to, you know, sit about and do fuck all. So I was kept busy. And then I started to burn myself out because, you know, there was like a, over 100 odd engineers in the company. And, you know, I think there was, you know, a fraction, maybe 20% were actually still working, but try to get through the same workload. Now, I was lucky in a sense because my area at the time that I worked in was a stone throw away from my house. But it was also an area that kept me humble given the fact that some people's houses that I was going into were, you know, a sight for sore eyes, so to say, and, you know, just going home at night sometimes and thinking to myself, well, I have got, you know, heat and hot water. Like, these people stay 10, 15 minutes from me. They don't, right? So that was, you know, and it's another story. Perspective. Perspective. So, um, yeah, and then, you know, the more the lockdown happened, the more and more engineers were going off and whatever else, and I was just working like a dog, mate, like on call, weekends, you name it. So I just was like, you know what, I'm burning myself into the ground here. So phone the manager and I just says, look, listen, by the way, I'm in all these group chats with all these engineers that are choking to get back to work. They're dying to get back to work, right? Because, you know, they might have been the breadwinners in their, in their, their family home, right? And they're on 80% of their basic salary. A lot of these guys relied on overtime. They relied on the on-call, they relied on that. That was what was paying their mortgage. That was, was what was probably keeping them, you know, probably above that line. So I just called one day and I just says, look, listen, I'm feeling burnt out to fuck. Like, what can we do here? Can we either change what I'm doing daily? Because it's the same thing that I've been doing every single day. But they weren't moving people departments because of COVID. So the, long story short, the, the conversation just basically went well, if you don't do something, I'm out. So what are we doing about this? So I went in, had a meeting. Um, initially, they'd says, look, go and take a few days off, recharge your batteries, come back in, have another meeting, blah, blah, blah. So I've turned up to the next meeting and they're like, where's your van? And I was like, so I turned up my car. And they're like, you know, come back to work today? I was like, nah. I was like, that weekend, that, that time off has just made me realise that I ain't fucking doing this anymore. Like, I am working like a fucking Trojan. Looking back, money was okay. Probably at the time might be great for that environment. But I was just like, look, I'm not going to burn any bridges. Here's my notice period. I'll work, blah, blah, blah. No, no, take another few days off. Just, you know, take that trying time. To trying to keep me right, which is understandable and fair enough. So it just says, look, to bring somebody back for you, f well, I'd asked to go on furlough. I'd says, look, I want to go on furlough. I'm in, you know, chats with all these guys are dying to get back to work. Just put me on furlough and bring some of the engineers back or, you know, swap one for one. Mm. In my opinion, it's a fucking easy thing to do. So I've got the director in the meeting saying, yeah, David, that's fine. I'll put you on furlough and we'll swap over. But I also have my line manager saying, nah, you don't get to dictate. Mm. And I'm like, I'm not dictating. I'm asking because these people clearly need to get all the extra money. Whereas, you know, I don't. By this point, I already had property. So I was already getting cash flow, right? Yeah. So it became a point where I wasn't doing the job for the money. I was just sticking at it for the experience because the end goal... You're building towards the gas company. I wanted to have my own gas company. So, yeah, it obviously just went a bit, you know, it just says, look... How quickly does DX start to build after you leave? So I always remember, right, I left and it was round about June. 
don't know what year off the top of my head, right? 2020, mm, maybe lockdown, tw- yeah. it was, yeah, 2020, June 2020. Now, I think at that point in time, the borders had opened to go to Spain. So, the first thing I done was get on a flight and I went to Marbella for two weeks <laughs> with a few of the boys, right? So, went over there for a couple of weeks to go and you know get a bit of sun, relax, recharge, and then it wasn't until I came back. Because I always remember we set DX up on the 13th of July 2020. So yeah, you're right, it's 2020, which is going to be a four years, you know, in a, in a, in a few in. months. Yeah, yeah, it's so quick, by the way. So when I've came back from Marbella, you know, I had used to have another business partner, um, which we can discuss as well. I'm quite open with that, it's no problem. So we had been having conversations prior to me kind of going away and whatever else, right? He'd approach me and says, look, we could maybe set something up. Um, and it was my ex's dad at the time. So that's another, you know, that's another interesting one, right? So what had happened was went to Spain, came back, and then we came back and had those conversations. Um, and this was going to be something broader than a gas company. DX is all-encompassing. It's not just one area. Well, precisely, but what we were actually going to do initially, and Company South will show this, we set DX up to be a marketing company. That was going to be a lead generation company because at the time we had a contact who says look if you can generate the leads i can get you into my business so you've got a client straight away so it'll be ready made money be quick money like you'll get paid blah 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 so we're like okay cool so we were you know i was new to business never mind what lead generation was right so you know we were dabbling and dabbling and doing what we're doing and then very quickly i realized i was like so wait a minute here we're passing this company maybe 15 20 leads right they're maybe, you know, selling five or six of them. And they're maybe making anywhere between, say, five and 20 grand. Why am I fucking do that? <laughs> Rather than just get paid, I think it was like 120 yeah. quid for the lead or something like that. Whatever we set up back in the day, right? So I was like, well, hang on a minute. I'm sure we can fucking do this because I'm a gas engineer. I'm, I know people in the trade. I'm sure we can. So very quickly, that conversation started to change. And then that's when we set DX Home Improvements up. So... Yeah, we just went for there. So basically from the, the first kind of, you know, the July to the December, we were just getting the, you know, the marketing set up, getting the website done, you know, making social media and, you know, all of this type of stuff. And I had never had a business in my life. So when I was registering on Company's House, paying the 12 quid, I was like dead excited. I was like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I've got a business, blah, blah, blah. To get the bank account, you, you know, you, you can really... The admin's know, getting ticked off. Do all of that the stuff that I fucking hate now, right? So... Done that, and then as I says, I think between maybe the July and the December, I think we've done about 40, 40 grand in sales, maybe 50 or something like that. kind of stuff from jobs we doing? So again, it was just like uh, double glazing, window jobs. Yep. So that's what my, that's what the other business partner has kind of background came from, and that was the leads that we were generating. So we already kind of had a little bit of a knowledge on that. So basically we were, you know, running some campaigns, look, or we were actually, ba- and then, you know, we were buying leads off people. and That you would then follow up on. We were all over the place, but, you know, we were doing everything. You know, I was phoning the leads, I was making the appointments, I was going to set the appointments. This, this is where the sky skills came back to four hundred percent so this is where things that you know i've done in my previous job started to all come together essentially there's a, a term that i learned and it formalized something i've been thinking about for a long time from a, a previous guest called dr meg j she's a clinical psychologist in the u.s and she talks yeah. about building identity capital oh, and yeah. now identity capital's formal qualifications in education mm-hmm. but it's also your work experience it's your personality yeah. traits it's your experiences that you gain through hard conversations on the phone yeah. with somebody wanting to quit their sky it's of the course. time when you had to deal with a, a a challenging individual in the middle of mcdonald's and you mm-hmm. learned how to what am i a man that stands up for his principles or am i yeah, a man yeah, yeah. That, that, that stays and allows some to unfold uh-huh. in front of me of and all these things accumulate to be the man that you are today and so many things that we can think back to on they sort of point towards how you're going to behave in the future like your you know, your habits from a year ago are going to result in who david is in 2024 right now of because course. of how you behaved previously yeah and in in the workplace in the business environment so many things that you've done in the past are hints at how you're going to conduct yourself with how dx grew in 2020 all the way through to now yeah and it's i always remember um paul one of my business coaches he said he always said to me he's like you've left like a blueprint previously you know your work ethic you've took the money you've not been you know blew it you've done this you've invested in yourself he said so there was a, a blueprint left behind and it's not until i sit and maybe reflect which i don't do very often 
Um, From when we've been speaking recently, I think you're getting better at it, 100%. I, yeah, it's something that I've been taking on board and something that can be so powerful, even from a, a personal point of view, personal development point of view, business. So it's something that I'm really, really trying to do more of. But yeah, he'd always said to me, like, you've left like a, a blueprint, basically. And, you know, that leaves clues of going forward of, of what's going to happen. And it, it is so true. So... We'd done like maybe, as I says, 40, 50K and, you know, we we're just kind of getting set up and then obviously Christmas came, construction shuts down, holidays. So I remember just before that, we, you know, we were talking about potentially bringing in our first hire, right? Um, who, again, was through my, one of my business partners, through his contacts, somebody he used to work with and somebody that worked with me for a long time until recently. And yeah, he was our first hire. So basically he was going to be, you know, we're bringing somebody in to start phoning the leads for us and planning a diary so that we could just get out on the road more and sell more. You'd be going into the homes to do the actual quotes and the sales. Exactly. Now, I'm not a trained sales specialist by any stretch of imagination, but I always remember the first appointment that year sold it, right? And it was massive proof of concept. I still remember the lady to this day. She still gives us recommendations to this day. Now, I don't think at the time that she knew that we had basically just set up because, you know, I just basically says, look, this is the way that we operate the business and, you know, whatever else. Perception's reality and how you paint the picture is yeah. very, very important. Yeah, and, you know, the, the way I can, I can, honestly, I can still remember the exact house. I could probably, you know, remember where it was, remember the job. We still use some of the pictures on socials because it was a nice property. And massive proof of concept, walked out of there with like a two, two and a half grand deposit, something like that, whatever it was. And I was like, oh, wow. If I get five of them a week, that's 10 grand cash flow. One of my favourite things to talk about in the podcast is when somebody gets proof of concept of something that they go on to build for the first time and the buzz that it gives them. Again, we'll talk about Mackenzie. We're going to meet him for dinner tonight. Yeah. He got one of his first drop shipping orders when he was at the bar in Sanctuary on a Sunday night <laughs> in Glasgow in September 2021. And then Amazing. the next morning he woke up and it had gone from like £27 or whatever he'd sold the diffuser for on drop shipping to £570. And he was like, this product works. So in the same it's... way, you came out of this lady's house and you were like, we're going to sell double glazing windows. Let's go. Bro, I came out of that house fucking buzzing. <laughs> absolutely buzzing right <laughs> and I've, I've jumped into my car i've got the contract i've got the paper because we had all of that you know set up like we, we set ourselves up for success let's have all the correct documentation let's have the paperwork you're let's, thorough and i think people don't always know that but yeah. you are a man that ticks the boxes I've, I've also got like that engineer brain where everything needs to be boom 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 right sometimes that can be neg a negative thing but we can we can chat about that so i remember Going into my car and I was like, couldn't phone Sean quick enough. I was like, bro, I just got a fucking deal. Come on, here we go. And he was like, no way, amazing. It was like a, a big thing. And then, you know, as I says, I was driving up the road. I was driving to my next appointment, rather. And I was like, wow, like total proof of concept. And then I was like, but the deposit. Um, And then obviously I'm like, okay, if, if we could just sell, with me, say five of them a week, right? Or five jobs. Obviously every job will be different order values and whatever else, but you know where, where I'm going with that. I'm like, we could collect 10 grand a week in deposits. And, you know, there was only four of us. Obviously, the guy that we'd hired, he was on a wage. But I'm like, okay, this can start to fucking change my life. Like, that's really good money. But then, you know, when I started to, you, for the first 46 weeks where you're just selling the jobs, that's great because deposits are coming in all the time, right? Nothing else is coming in because we haven't installed any jobs. All the, the windows and doors that we manufacture or sell, they're all bespoke and made to measure, so it needs to go through a process, right? So then it started to be like, okay, we're collecting all these deposits, but now we're fitting jobs, so we're getting the balance. So maybe 8K a job, 9K, do you know what I mean? Like, And maybe jobs were, you know, like we'd sold some big jobs at the beginning. So overall in the January, I think we'd done about 40 grand in revenue. Which, compared to the previous six months, was... was Well, it was the full six yeah. months of revenue, 40, 50k, whatever it was, right? So we'd done, like, 40-odd K. February, 80-odd grand. March, 123 grand or something like that. So that's a quarter of a million quid in three months, right? So by this point in time, you know, there's a good bit of money flying about. And I'm like, holy fuck. We've cracked it. Like, this is fucking good. But then things started to get a bit, you know... We what were the big challenges that started? We grew too quick. 
like too quick. So we went from, you know, not having an office to boom, there's a little office, probably about the size of this, maybe actually a little bit smaller. And then very quickly we realised, you know, well, we need an operations team, we need, you know, this, we need that. And it was like, well, the office next door is like five times the size. Went down the stair um, to get the number to call the, the landlord or whatever, right? It was Red Tree Business Suites. Hell ho. <laughs> really? Um, mad, right? Compared so, to where you are now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So got the number i was like look we've actually took this office on like six weeks ago we've underestimated things can we take the bigger office yeah of course cool boom and you know we just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew which isn't a bad thing right it was total proof of concept now again just to reinforce no prior business experience nothing to do with sales marketing processes systems operations nothing so we were learning as we were going of course we had that uh, you know obviously myself and sean are the same age uh we'll be well 29 this year sean just turned 29 so um obviously you know the business partner that we had he was older in his 50s so we were relying on him industry really. experience yeah, as well yeah. and you lean on that because as you say you came from that gas engineering background exactly i came from a, a trade background and you know a bit of a salesy background and, and call centers or whatever with sky so um yeah so we just we, we just grew too quickly so sales were going well but fulfillment was a challenge yeah so basically obviously as you grow sales then you need more fitters like you need more trades you need more systems you need more processes operations like we never really had that and we were probably running about doing a bit of everything at the beginning. But you know what? You need to fucking go through that. Uh, f you need you need to go through that pain to learn. One of the toughest things in life is you're going to make mistakes to go forward, right? And what you do for that is you grow. And, you know, we were in the mindset of, of well, you know, a lot of people out there blame everybody else. I'll blame myself for everything. Anything bad that happens in my life, it's my fault. We, we spoke about that, you know, earlier. We've had a few chats about that, right? High-level accountability. And I believe that's one of the major things that let me get my business to where it is. Because, you know, it's, it's easy to sit there and go, oh, I had a cunt of a week, like, you know, last week, for example, right? It's a challenge for you <laughs> in many was, respects. It was a challenge. We all have them. We, everybody has them, right? And I like to keep it real. So that was why, you know, I went a bit public with it, my stories and whatever else. And I got, you know, a lot of responses and, you know, a lot of people saying, I'm glad it's not just me this week. So it's, it's one of those things. But yeah, just come back to that. So we, we kind of, you know, relied on, you know, him to maybe bring in a bit more systems and processes. And listen, he didn't work from an operations background. It was sales and marketing, of course. So we just grew too quick. I remember I went on holiday for two weeks. I came back. And I walked into my, my office at the time, right? And I was like, who the fuck are all these people and who's paying them? Is <laughs> recognising them? Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? I was like, holy fuck. Now, obviously, when I was on holiday, I was still keeping in touch with people. I was still keeping in touch with Sean and uh, it was Paul. It was my, my old business partner. And um, I was just mad though. Like, obviously, and again, at the point in time, I looked very young, so I've strutted into this office and people are like who the fuck is this guy and I'm like I own the company mate who are you <laughs> of course you know, there's so. a level of you want to bring respect and authority and if you've not been involved in the recruitment process for that particularly when yeah. it was smaller when you maybe would have had more hands on of course. it does feel like you're losing a little bit of the control and the ownership of the place it, it was and listen you know again you know like we'll take the high level of accountability but we just quickly realised that you know myself and Sean and Paul we were losing the synergy we, we kind of wanted different things and there's no harm in that, right? Of course, at that point in time, it was challenging and, you know, there was stuff going on, pop business politics or whatever else. But see, at the end of the day, like, it is what it is. So we... Before you change the structure, you hit 1.1 million, is that not right? Yeah, mate, year one, right? So obviously, we'd done the, the 40, the 80, the 1, 2, 3, or, you know, whatever it was off the top of my head. So it's like a quarter million. But yeah, that year we finished on one point while you net, which in theory is actually at 1.3 gross, right? But we just work on net figures. Um, so that, again, proof of concept was, I've just took a business from zero to seven figures in 12 months with no business experience, no fucking handouts, no help, no, I just had to figure it out. And then obviously we got to like the September, October time and that's when myself and Sean started to get, you know, a different vision from Paul, right? Which is cool. Like that's completely People fine. Have different priorities, different goals. People have different priorities. You know, he'd worked in the industry for, you know, quite some time and he'd been used to working a certain way. 
which is normal, that certain way we didn't agree with. So that caused friction and that caused challenges. And listen, see if I seen Paul tomorrow. Hi, mate. How you doing? Hello. I would speak to him, right? Still, you know, I obviously... Business is business, and I think that's an important thing. There's always going to be people that sometimes things become untenable with, and that's the nature of it. Of course. But yep. business can get left at the door, yep. and personal, personal and, relationships can remain. And obviously, like, it was my ex's dad, so obviously I know the family, and, you know, when I'm back home, sometimes, you know, I could potentially bump into these people. I don't, I don't want to be, you know, in an environment where I'm like, oh, you know, it's a bit awkward or whatever. Might be a little bit awkward, but the way that things were left was probably a bit sour, right? But, you know, it's just one of those things, like... What direction did you decide to take DX in? So we just decided to regroup a little bit, right? So sometimes I'm a big believer in you have to go back to go forward, right? Now, it got to the... I'm not going to lie, mate. It got to, like, the October, right? And I was like, I am fucking dying for December because it shut down. Like, I was like, we just need to get to December and reassess things. Now, by this point in time, there's a load of money flying about because obviously we grew that big. There's a lot of staff. We had a lot of overheads. We, you know, we had a lot of suppliers to pay. And, you know, I've spoke briefly about this, but I don't mind opening up about it a bit more. Like, DX was nearly gone, mate. It was nearly gone, right? Because we we hadn't got ourselves... Well, we had got ourselves into a mess, right? But, the, but now I know why. I didn't have any systems. I didn't have any processes. I didn't have anything. And again, the way the business was structured, it wasn't structured to retain profit. More people were making money than, you know, than probably should have been and taking money and wh whatever else, right? So we just says, look, we parted ways probably end of September, start of October. So me and Sean just says, look, mate, I'm going to go and sell. We had a couple of sales reps in and I was like, right, I'll deal with sales and marketing, you deal with operations. Let's just get to the end of the fucking year and let's just smash it and do the best that we can. We have been doing like maybe, you know, 60 grand in uh, October, I think it was, right? We got to the November. Now, I know that November was going to be crucial for January because all the jobs that I sell in December, they're going to get fitted in January because... There's a lead time and there's a shutdown. There's a lead time, there's a shutdown, and we've obviously already got jobs, right? So I think we, I know, I know we smashed the November. So when we had sat down at the end of the year, we were fully booked in January. So like fully booked for us, we were fully booked with the, the capacity and the teams and everything else. So we could forecast what we were going to be collecting every single week in January without selling a job. Right, that's what's forecasted. These customers have all paid 20% deposit. They owe us 80% balance because that's our philosophy, right? Sometimes it might be a bit different for different products, but generally that's it. So we knew that when we came back in January, we, we had a lot of cash to come in. But when we sat down with it, uh, now this is another thing, we'd kissed a few frogs with a few accountants during the year. Like, I remember my accountant f f phoned me, like, one Thursday morning. He's like, oh, David, how you doing? I was like, oh, I've not heard from you for a while. How's things? Yeah, you've got an 18 grand VAT bill tomorrow. <laughs> That's called a curveball. <laughs> I'm like, got the right person, mate. <laughs> and he was like, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously. But I was like, can't be right. So I challenged him on it. Now, at that point in time, don't know what I know now, but accounts and VAT and finance and whatever else, blah, 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 right? But I was like, that's not right. It can't be right. And sure enough, he was like, oh, yeah, let me go and check some things. And, you know, he was like, can you maybe send me over this statement again? And he's like, oh, I don't have these invoice, right? So I was like, fucking hell, man. Like, how? That's where you just pay experts to deal with it, to remove that from your mind, and it gives you peace of mind. My finance team that I have just now are unbelievable. Um, they allow you to focus on what matters. Exactly. They, that allows me not to worry about things and just to focus on what I'm good at. And that's, you know, building, growing and, and scaling the business and generating revenue. Um, but I also believe in hiring experts as well. I like to do that. You know, if I'm not, you know, an expert or something, come work for me and I'll pay you whatever you want. Like, that's my mentality, right? So, obviously, we'd sat down with, you know, we, by the way, this is a new accountant, right? Um, who is unbelievable and that's who we work with to this day. So... She was like, guys, what do you just want to do? Because this is your expenses, this is what you owe out, blah, 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 this is cash in the bank. And, you know, at that point, it was sad, mate, because I was like, wow, just worked for a full year. Not many people can say they've set a business up in January from absolutely zero and do 
you know, over a million quid in sales, right, in 12 months. So again, we talk about proof of concept. That was my proof of concept. So me and Sean took some time to, look, let's just, don't do anything just now. Let us just think about what we want to do. So I'm like, bro, we had to see, listen, me and Sean are always weird. We always think the same, right? So I'm like, we're like, it was, uh, we've got a good business model. We've got a good business plan. You don't turn over that kind of money if you don't have something that doesn't fucking work. And the market wants it. And the market wants it, right? And plus, what we done was we done things different to everybody else. Most double glazing salespeople in the UK, if you've seen White Gold on Netflix, like, they're fucking high-pressure, long-winded sales pitches. Yeah, it should be 30 grand, but today we'll give you it for five. That's fucking bullshit, right? So we done things completely different, really transparent. You know, of course, we offer discounts for certain things, like can we do a bit of marketing in your property? Can we do this? Can we do that? That's always going to be there. Of course it is, right? But we just, our sales process was so unique to the market. And I knew that because I was out selling the appointments. So when I'm getting into people's houses, they're like, you know, straight away, you know, sometimes I've got these barriers up. Whoa, how long you got in my fucking house for? Again, go back to the sky. I'm like, I fucking love these people. I love these challenges. Before you know it, we're sitting 45 minutes later signing up deals, right? Off on a tangent there, but you, you, you get where I'm going. We can talk more about what you did different with DX yeah. as well, but let's talk about this restructuring change. So the restructuring change. So we we sat down and again, we had this the same philosophy. We had the same mentality. We knew what we had worked and it was just a case of like, see if we just do the same again, but we don't make one, two, three, four, five, six hundred mistakes. Fucking hell, mate. We'll have a good business and we'll, we'll make a lot of money. So at that point in time, the business owed out more than what we had. So me and Sean, obviously we've taken dividends, wages throughout the year because there was a lot of cash lying about. So we're, and you know, obviously I had property as well. So I'm like, fuck it. We just pumped the money in. And do you know what we done? Every single supplier, every single person that we owed money to, we cleared them. And why do we do that? Peace of mind, mate. Peace of mind, right? When I came back in January and I knew that I was fully booked, had all this money coming in, all we had to do was sell. Debt was zero. Debt was zero. Nothing. We owed nobody any money. Anybody that was due money got paid, right? Um, And then I was like, okay, so if we just reset, regroup, I've learned a l- f- fucking learned more than probably most people do in five years, mate, in a year, trust me. So we reset, we regrouped, and you know, we let a lot of staff go. That was a hard thing because it was Christmas time. But sometimes as a business owner, you just need to do what you need to do. We had to regroup. We had to just do what we had to do. You've become a big employer now. If you'd remained a bigger employer at that time when it wasn't right to be a bigger employer, you would have sunk the business. Oh, Whereas easily. now you provide for the people that work for you and their families. Mm-hmm. But if you'd carried on down the path and from an ego perspective for, for, or from a sympathy or empathy perspective yeah, yeah. had kept these people on, yeah. you, you, wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have still been the net. We would probably have been out of the game. Yeah, million percent. So obviously, you know, in business, you know, sometimes you need to have these types of conversations and you need to, you know, have these tough decisions to make. But I had to do what I had to do, right? I had to just put the business first and say, guys, sorry, this is the situation. So what we done was we downgraded the office and we moved into it was down at um down at like London Road McDonald's, that kind of neck of the woods. There was a, a storage vault type, you know, thing. And when I say this was a box office, right? But I'm like, we're well, regrouping. No ego. Most people could have had an ego there and went, you know, oh, I can't go back there, or can't go to a smaller office. But we just regrouped and reset completely. Um, got the smaller office and fucking smashed it, mate. Two over two point two million we done that year. Exciting. Um, doubled and it was profitable this time. Doubled, profitable, which is the main thing. And again, learned a fucking lot. Learned a lot about myself. Learned a lot about, you know, that's when we really started to, you know, grow as a business and we started to bring more people in and there was more staff and we started buying vans and we started doing this. And when I go home, there's no better buzz for me sometimes when I drive by, you know, one of my vans on the road. We've got a big fleet now i get uh, i get a lot of pictures you know yeah oh, you know so like, saw your vans at this at this address or whatever else so yeah. that feels amazing you mentioned sales process and how that differed from what the rest of the market did yeah you chose to differentiate yourself in many other ways as well what mm-hmm. are some of the key areas that dx decided to say i'm not going to be like the rest of the crowd so i think it was because i was out selling from day one right now obviously i went with paul Mo business partner and you know he was you know 
listen, he was talking us through the process and this is what we used to do. And, you know, obviously at the at that young young point, I'm like, I'm naive and I'm like, okay, well, we'll just do that. And then I was very quickly realised, I was like, hmm, I wouldn't like to be sold that way. Now, I'm not saying the way that I like to be sold to or whatever's the fucking be all and end all, right? But I was just like, if I wouldn't like to be sold like that, I don't want my company to operate like that. So again, you know, mo- and then I started to hear it more and more when I was in these appointments. Like, listen, how long are you going to be? You know, I've had such and such and they've took four hours of my time, right? And I'm like, what do you mean four hours? Yeah, they're like, they wouldn't, I've had like guys like say to me, like I've had to actually physically throw people out my property. And it's really notorious for that in the UK for, you know, double glazing sales and maybe, you know, roofing, rough cat, all home improvements that you're actually getting a company to do it, not a one-man band, right? Because a lot of these people, they come from the same background years ago, where it was like the old weather seal days, from what I'm led to believe, right? Um, Which, you know, I've never been a part of it, but I've came across many people that were part of that environment. But these people that have then set businesses up, they all operate the same way, mate. It's the same thing because they're like, let's just do the same thing that we know. Whereas I've came along and in my opinion, I'm young, fresh, new ideas. And, you know, very quickly, you know, we were getting, you know, musters with competitors not being happy and we're taking a market share and great. You know, maybe you should stop focusing on what I'm doing with my business and start putting your energy back into your own business. So the sales process that we do it's very relaxed. So it's all about building relationships. It's all about building rapport. Now you've got your 12 step selling circle, right? That most people in sales has probably heard of. And that's what all these companies generally go to. You need to do this, this, this. But I'm like, well, what happens if you can't get your circle to go in a circle? What happens if you need to go from 0.1 to 0.5 to 0.3 to 0.8? Like you need to be adaptable. Again, go back to Sky, go back to appointments. You need to be adaptable to certain situations. So we just built a sales process, which in my opinion, is it, this is the normal way to sell, so to say, yep. where it's just relaxed. Customer-led. There's no pressure. Um, we target pain points. So again, that stems to my one of my processes in the office, pulling that out of customers, maybe on my ads as well. And then, you know, we'll measure, for example, if it's windows and doors, we'll go around and we'll measure all your windows and doors. Now, because they're bespoke and they're made to measure, we'll let you style and design them. You know, how, what way do you want this window to open? Do you want, you know, your bay window? Do you want your canopy? Like, all of these things. Is it a, a casement, tilt and turn, sash and case, reversible, right? What what kind of windows do you want to, to suit that? But we also educate as well. So, you know, most people are like, you know, because let's be honest, four years ago, I knew fuck all about Windows, right? So most people are like, well, I don't know, like, what do you recommend? So like for your style, your property, you know, maybe an old tenement, maybe get a nice sash and case or up the West End, whatever else, right? So we like to do it in a customer service manner. It's consultative selling. You're listening to what they're interested in and then you provide what is called like almost like a trusted advisor mm-hmm. service where you're saying, yes, this is our expertise, yep. property similar to yours have done this. Mm-hmm. Actually, here's some photos of what we've done, the reassurance piece. I, I love that side of sales where you're not sticking it down the customer's neck and you're actually leading them to their own solution, yep. but it happens to be a solution that you can provide at a good price. Exactly. And one of the things that we that I like to do in sales, I'm really big on psychology, like body language, tonality, how people are acting, like I'm observing constantly, right? So sometimes you would need to mirror a customer, right? To be a bit, you know, if you want to go into the deeper psychology side of things, that can relax certain people. If you're mirroring their body language, if somebody's quite abrupt and, you know, they're quite, how long you got to be in my house for? I'm not saying that I'm standing there like that, but if you can identify that and come around it. And that's one of the major things that goes in my sales train. We say, look, you need to be adaptable. Although this is your perfect scenario, you're never, you're, you're not going to always, a house where the guy's completely different to what you're expecting. You're not always going to get your perfect scenario where it's, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Oh, come in, I've got tea and biscuits ready for you. Sit down and tell me everything about your wonderful company. Very rarely does that happen, right? So we need to be adaptable. So that's one of the things that's built in and we'll role play certain situations and whatever else. But the sales process, it's just customer service based. We're customer experience based. Now, that's what we've built our business on. 
of course, when we've started to grow and do big numbers and we're growing at an even bigger rate now, right, we're going through another growth period. For us, my service levels are the most important thing. And I'm not going to sit here and say every single customer that's signed up with DX Home Improvements has had 100% five stars. 99.9% of them have, right? But there's that small percentage where things go wrong. But again, what do we do? We take accountability, right? I've put customers up in the Dakota for a weekend. All expenses paid, breakfast, lunch and dinner, bottles of wine. Why would you do that, David? Because my business didn't provide the service that I expected this customer to have and they had some issues. And again, what are those issues? People. Whose responsibility is that? Me, I'm the business owner. If somebody's not performed on a job or they've made a mistake or they've done this and they've done that, like, I don't think you would be able to speak to any home improvement business owner that's, you know, fixed a problem in that way. Now, of course, I would rather not have the fucking problem. But when it comes up, let's deal with it in the best way. Let's deal with it in the best possible way. You know, obviously some compensation or whatever. Like, I'm very real about that. Like, not every job, especially in construction, you spit like, my office phone me today, like, we've got fucking, like, 80 windows delivered today and there's going to be the same schedule tomorrow and the next day. And I'm like, okay, let's make sure that, you know, if that's a, you know, over 200 windows, there's going to be scratches on bits of glass. Of course there is when you get to that volume. Like As a percentage, there's going to be a problem somewhere. As a percentage, there's going to be a problem and I'm more than happy to sit here and be real about it because... That's that's it's fact. how you deal with that problem, and it's how you treat the customer off the back. But of it, it's like how you, you deal with it. So again, you know, like from that perspective, from the, the the sales background and that, yeah, it was one of those ones where I've just created a nice and easy process. There's no high pressure sales. There's no long winded sales pitch. We'll maybe take up forty five minutes of your time. Could be half an hour of your time. Like I've sold a guy a twenty five grand job sitting in the van listening to Clyde one. <laughs> Adaptability, like you, I speak about adaptability. There you go. There's your prime example. That was the environment he wanted to work with you. I've rocked up to an appointment. The guy was like, "Oh, fuck me! I forgot you were coming." The missus is in. The family's over, and I'm like, "Okay." Obviously, I'm like try to objection handle. I'm like, "Well, I'm here." Like, I drove an hour to the guy's house. So I'm like, "Well, let's." Ha-. He's like, "Can I just jump in your van? We can have a chat." Of course, we can. Got the phone in on. He's like, Talk about football. Luckily, it was the same team, obviously, right? So, got chatting and we listened to the phone and he's like, right, so what's the price anyway? And I'm like, well, I kind of need to, for this one, it was a, a roof and rough cast. So, I could kind of, you know, do an observation for you externally before we got a technical surveyor out. So, I says, look, this is the price. All right, cool. So, I'm like, okay. Sitting in my van, listening to Clyde one, saying I'm a 25 grand deal. So, for me, I'm like, that just shows you and by the way, most other companies would have rescheduled that appointment. Oh, look, we'll, we'll reschedule it then. We'll come back. They lack the flexibility, they lack adaptability. That's your word, isn't it? They'll, they'll, they'll reschedule the appointment because the salesperson can't get into the house, can't do this, can't do that. I don't know how many deals I used to clean up on with that because I'm like, I'm not doing anything different. And I used to f- like feed this back to my sales team. Guys, just got a 25 grand job sitting in my fucking van. Like, let's let's be real about it here. Like, one of the products that we we, we done was rough casting. Yeah, it's a kind of seasonal thing because of the weather and whatever else. Most people, if you're going to see the rough casting, just expect you to come and have a look at the property and, and that's it. So, obviously, I would try and, you know, it's all right, you come in your property and we can, we can have a chat about things. Some people would say, what do you need to come in for? Like, rough casting's here. <laughs> that's the type of people that you're dealing with, right? So, I'm like, cool, fair enough. So many deals I've sold in the rain, mate. Like, just standing there talking, giving pricing and going through our processes. So, but again, most people, they need to get into the property. They need to sit down. They need to go through this big fucking sales pitch. Is that required in this day and age? Do you know what? Do you know why it was so successful 20, 25 years ago? Because that was the normal then. Nobody had fucking, you know, social media. Nobody had fucking internet. People used to believe that, oh, I got my windows done. Uh, this week the guy gave me a fucking belter of a deal it was meant to be 25 grand got it for 7 exactly naivety was the, the, the case naivety was huge then now I can't speak for myself but looking back and looking at data and experience of, of course that would be my opinion on that so nowadays you know you go and you pull out your phone 
you can compare. F- find out everything, do you know what I mean? Or, I want to talk about a mayor for DX that you guys really stand out in, and that for me is how you operate online from an ads perspective and a lead generation perspective, because when I first spent some time with you at the Growth Getters Mastermind, yeah, you were furiously talking about how do I make the most of the spend on this? How do I make the most of the spend on that? Because I know that I've got the product, I've got the service, but how do yeah. I reach the right people? So I fucking love marketing. Like, absolutely love it. Um, because for me, that's how you can, you know, accelerate and grow your business much quicker. People that, you know, don't spend any money on marketing, don't run ads and rely on word of mouth. By the way, I actually have a friend who's about to do a million pound on word of mouth. Wow, right? That is unbelievable. My pound sales through word of mouth, right? Doesn't really run ads. That freaks me out. I couldn't go to my bed and I didn't sleep. I would rather buy a customer, give them a good experience, get a recommendation, than sit and wait and somebody phone in my office. So, like, I'm obviously, we can speak about DX Academy, but something that, you know, I, I've got some one-to-one coaching clients that I work with just now, who... All of them, you know, at the start, they're like, what's ads? What's, what's Facebook ads? What's Google ads? And I'm like, well, you better go and get YouTube out and, and start watching tonight because it's going to change your life. That's a serious statement. Like, marketing is genuinely, like, it can fuel your business. It can buy you clients. You can make a lot of money through it if you do it correctly. So anytime I go to these masterminds or anytime I'm in a mastermind event or I'm speaking to people of, you know, that are, you know, high net worth, what's your marketing strategy? Well, I, I love it. Like, I absolutely love it. And this is coming from someone that never used to post on social media. Never. See, when I was growing DX, it took me about a year and a half and I actually went to a Jumpstart event, one of Paul's events. And obviously that was about property, but within that, I'm like, mm, there's things in there that I could take to my business and whatever else. And, then, you know, we been, me and Sean went on to work with Paul on a one-to-one basis. And obviously, you know, from a business perspective, you know, I'm pretty sure most people in here, if you see an ad for Paul, you're, you're not going to get fucking away until you, you click on it, right? So ha- having access to that, to, to speak that about... That level of intel. Right, it, it's game-changing. And then, obviously, like I always remember, you know, my my first post that I'd done on socials was I actually got a property and it made me 30 grand. One po- I didn't even put a selfie. It was like, that picture in my hand, it was black. Anybody selling any property... <laughs> Right, that was how basic it was. So again, was that proof of concept? So I was like, fucking hell. So through time, you know, me and Sean started to, you know, probably me more than Sean, right? Start to build in public as well. Start to build that, you know, I'm like, okay, I need to start building a a, a personal brand. Personal brand so important. And again, you go to these masterminds, it's like biggest example, the, the best analogy that I've got is, you know, you know Elon Musk, right? Who, who's more followers, Elon Musk or Tesla? Right. People used to always say Ronaldo or Real Madrid or whatever he was. It's it, completely correct. It is so correct, right? So, obviously, from the marketing perspective and the ad perspective, you know, we used to buy leads in and then, you know, I started to educate myself and started to get around more business owners that were spending money on ads. And then, for me, that's where it changed. And I was like, wow, I've been buying leads off of you at this amount, say, £60 a lead. By the way, that number could be invalid. Like that that's that's the game. That number could be invalid. I think that's what a, a lot of people have that perception where they first run ads. A lot of shit that market and stuff. Fucking kinda get don't know how you make money out of this bullshit. Fucking blah blah blah. How much have you spent? Five hundred quid. Oh. <laughs> it's not gonna make you millions, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like wake up. So but again, it comes from the mentality, comes from the mindset. You need to educate yourself and you need to see what marketing truly is. Now, of course, when I started to figure that out and I was like, well, if I just run my own ads instead of me paying you £60 a lead, see, I can generate them myself for 30 quid. So I'm like, well, I can spend the same amount of money that I'm spending with this guy, say three grand and getting 50 leads, but I can now spend three grand and get 100 leads. What's that going to do? And we think the quality is better as well. What's that going to do? If I've got double the amount of leads, I'm going to get, in theory, double the amount of appointments, which means I'm going to get double the amount of sales for the same amount of money like it blew my mind more strategic it's more strategic and it allows you to be in more control something that i, I really you know need to have and is the control aspect you recognize it. that in your personality 
sometimes too much because I'm like, you know, I, I, it's probably, you know, being a leader as such. Like, I just need to take control of certain situations or most situations and just make sure that stuff gets done and or I delegate and say, right, cool, this is the plan or whatever else, which is, that's just the way I've been. Um, and, you know, I, I would say I'm pretty pretty good at it. So, but the, obviously the, the marketing side of things, like the ads, like that can really, that really changed things for us. Now I've got a full marketing team. I've got a videographer. I've got ads guys. Like we're, we're, we're obviously actively recruiting now to add to that. So I'm looking for a head of marketing. So if anybody's, you know. <laughs> Skilled, <laughs> get in touch. Get in touch. So um, several roles like we recruit daily just now just because of the size of us and that's always a challenge. So, so but yeah, the, the, the marketing it really changed things for us and hiring the videographer and then, but one of the things that you really need to be, you know, looking at with marketing is strategy. Everything that, like we spoke about this, everything I post on social media, strategy. There's a, a reason behind it. There's a method behind it. Why is he posting talking about that? You might figure it in two or three days later. You know, it's it's one of those things where you need to have short term strategies, medium term strategies, and long term strategies. And like for a marketing perspective, a short term strategy is a direct lead form campaign. Long term would be like let's run traffic campaigns and let's build them up and nurture an audience and then retarget them and you know do all of this quirky stuff. So it just allowed us to scale the business so quick, and that's you know where we're at just now. Yeah, it's been it's been amazing to watch. You mentioned property jumpstart with Paul, but before that, you were almost an accidental landlord. Well, How did yeah, that happen? yeah, I know I was. Yeah, so essentially, and you also have mentioned the portfolio during periods like the gas engineering in the early days of dx which yeah. was supporting you so i think that's a huge part of your yeah journey isn't it of course so when i bought my first property um i lived with my mum at the time you know i was moving out i want that independence and you know whatever else i used to you know i had a flat that i that i rented and then the landlord took it back to sell it end up back at my mum's and i was like well oh, fuck this <laughs> i need my own space again so bought my first when i was buying my first property um, obviously it goes through legal, it takes a bit of time the guy had died so it took a bit of time as well time they, they sort all of that stuff out um, I still own that property to this day which is mad, the capital appreciation and that's unbelievable so went through the process, you know it was maybe about three weeks away from completing and my mum calls me, she's like um, can I talk to you and I says of course you can I'm moving to Spain I was like alright interesting yeah i've been off the job like blah, blah blah i've been thinking about it for a while she's not spoke to you blah blah i was like look amazing like really fucking happy for you hope you wish you all the best blah blah, blah. she's like but you can have my house so i was like sorry she's like yeah you can you can have my house like obviously i'm not going to sell it just to see what happens and whatever else and i'm like right okay but i'm like i'm buying a house she was like i know i was like what where am i going with this so i was like all right fuck it so I was like, well, we'll just rent it out. So when I started to, you know, mum moved away, living in that property, renting this property out, at the end of the month, I was just getting that money in my bank for doing nothing. I was like, well, imagine you had 10 of them. It's always the same. Imagine you had 10 of them. Whoa, well, that'd be amazing. I could make this amount of money every month without doing anything. So, you know, very quickly from a young age, you know, I was like, okay, two years later, bought our property. Two years later, bought our property. And that just kind of, you know, quickly transpired scaled, scaled, essentially scaled. as well. By the way, bought them all the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't have the same strategy that you've unlocked since working with Protégé and stuff like that. Yeah, I didn't have the same, um, I didn't have the same element of knowledge and expertise, bought these properties in my personal name, schoolboy era, right? Obviously the correct way to buy a investment properties through a limited company now, tax expenses, whatever else. So, um, yeah, but listen, you, what do you do you need to live and you learn I'll obviously not do that anymore so um, but yeah it's mad so just on that property I bought that for 72k I reckon now it's worth about 130 Wild. mad and you've been getting a rental yield in been it for however many years rental income since day one really um, and I've just actually put another tenant in it actually today just got the, they've paid three months up front just before I came um, and I'm getting 1100 quid a month for this property my last tenant was paying 550 quid. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> now, obviously, during that period of time, the wonderful changed. Scottish... No, that and also the wonderful Scottish government 
introduced this wonderful legislation. Rent control. Where yeah. you can't put your rent up because of cost of living and all this fucking bullshit. So my tenant, who is my mate, who will probably watch this, Gary, you have been stealing that <laughs> gaff from me for ages. So since he's moved on, you're now making adjustments So to it. obviously during that time as well, like my rate expired. So my mortgage trebled. So I went from making, you know, whatever it was to basically next to nothing. So when he texts me and says, I'm thinking about leaving, I was like, oh, okay, mate. But secretly I was like, fucking... Ah, you booked him a taxi and somebody <laughs> to help him remove his stuff. I was van. like, when? <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's fascinating that you actually had started to build in the background your portfolio before you maybe unlocked the investment side of things yes. that we look at now in terms yep. of the portfolio that you're adding to at such a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. yeah. What led to you going to Jumpstart? Truthfully. Paul's ads were following me about for ages because I'd clicked on them, haven't I? So, you know, and Paul's a, Paul will tell you himself, he's he's, a, he's, a, he's quite open about this. He's obviously, he's like, maybe people watch his stuff for six months before they'll take action. He knows his client and he knows his data inside out, right? So, for me, and by the way, we went to the one in Edinburgh because I couldn't be fucked seeing people in Glasgow. That was where my mentality was. That's where my mindset was. I'm like, do you know what? Going to go to Glasgow which is where I lived, and I'm like, Fuck, let's go to Edinburgh, let's get out of the way, right? Because if people are going to go to the one in Glasgow, they're probably not going to think to go to the one in Edinburgh. So we waited till the July it was, um, me and Sean went through to Edinburgh. Obviously, it's a two-day event, starts on Saturday. Um, we got there Saturday morning, afterwards, checked in at a hotel. Pff, mate, we, we were minds were blue mate like genuinely and this was somebody that had a portfolio already so you must have been excited to see what opportunities like you just had. just some of the stuff that he was obviously going through and like i know a lot of people that have seen me do that and they've started to do that now you know i see them at jumpstart events some of my staff are now doing that right which is another story so which I have no qualms with whatsoever, by the way. But just you probably want them to build financial freedom. Listen, of course, I want everybody to be successful as they possibly can. A hundred percent. If you're in my business for, you know, two, three, four years, and then you go to do something better, wish you all the best. That's the way I've always been. So when we went to the, the event and just realising, you know, the different ways of, you know, structuring deals and, like, for example, an assisted sale, how the f you can flip somebody's property without buying it. It's fucking, it's amazing. And something that I'm actually looking at over here. No heard anybody doing something like that in Dubai. But I think there's a, you know, just let my secret out of the bag there, but I think there's a gap in the market for it over here. Obviously, you're dealing with big numbers over here. So rather than me maybe having to go and buy a villa, maybe four or five million dirham, if I could get a seller on my side where it's a bit run down, because there's a lot of property in Dubai approaching that. First generation stuff. 15, 20 year mark, certain areas in Dubai where, you know, it's like the old mahogany, you know what, you know what I mean? The old brown the mahogany the and quality. the finish isn't the same. And, you know, like some of those villas, if they just got a, a renovation, which, you know, I have a construction team who could potentially do that as well. And then we just remarket it. But we agree a price pre, pre, pre refurb, something that they're happy with for their price in the current condition. But then, I think in Dubai you need to structure that a bit differently because people would be like, well, I could just go and do that. that like, of course. people can do that back home, but there's money everywhere over here, right? So people would be like, this, as soon as you approach a seller with an idea like that, they're probably going to be like, oh, they might run with it themselves. Yeah. Whereas in the UK, because they've not got the capital to do the refurb, that's it's, why it's they're not looking happening. to sell, essentially. And this is what I think is shows your business savvy side is DX Home Improvements works with so many people who have done paul's education who've done other yep. uh, property investment courses in, in the uk because you guys can be that trusted partner to help them do things like an assisted sale or whatever else they're working on of course and and that's one of the things for us that we actually ended up signing up for protege was two things we had just spent like 10 11 grand on quads the week before we went there right so then i'm like well if we get this money but we're going to get into this environment if we pay whatever it was back then and we're going to get into an environment where people are refurbing properties 
and we have a you know a construction company, you're going to make that the money back. Be amazing. But look at some of the guys you work with from Protege now. It's, How many deals have you done with them? I mean, insane. tons. Like I've even ended up becoming business partners with like Christy Hill, for example. You know, we're growing a, a portfolio together, and you know, he's smashing the sourcing. So for us, there's a lot of value exchanges there, and I like working with like-minded people. But obviously, getting into that environment, I was like, well, if I pay that for the course again, you can claim the VAT back. You can do this. You can do that. And then I'm going to get into an environment with 500 people who are needing to do refurbs. And very quickly, we got assisted sales. Like, we get deals to us. Now, again, I'm leveraging what I've got. So I'm, I'm going to leverage what I've got. We just got the keys to another exciting project in Dundee that we're going to be uh, do, doing quite an extensive refurb on. So looking forward to getting stuck into that. Uh, of course, all the other, you know, uh, refurbs that we've got on the go just now as well. So it's it, it was beneficial because it was like a kind of a circle. Yeah, the term more. that was in my head is, yes, circle, but also it feeds itself. So as you say, the investment into the course, great. Mm -hmm. The investment into working with other people, guess what? The money from that probably ends up in DX or yep. it ends up in, in you in the future investing into another portfolio, which again adds to your recurring revenue every month. <laughs> exactly. And it's one of those ones as well where like, you know, we've bought land as well and you know land's a long game you know the way we've bought it was very creative it was actually i ended up getting my money back for a yeah, creative way of doing things right so i'm like it's not cost me any money M my mate's using that just now as a kind of yard or whatever else because we've got planning restrictions and restraints we need to go for this to that to this to that right but the, the point i'm making here is who's going to build those properties dx Okay, so there's, you know, maybe six months I work for DX. So what do I need to do? I'll go and hire more people. I'll go and hire more tradies. I'll go and hire more brickies, more ground workers. You know, I've got already got, like, a full setup in my operations team, you know, operations manager, an architect, an architect technician, project manager, you know, brickies, ground workers, blah, blah, blah. It goes on, right? So, but again, why have I got all of that? Obviously, it feeds into DX, but... Yeah, I'm getting sent land deals constantly. I'm getting sent, you know, these deals constantly. And, you know, if I need an architect, instead of picking up the phone, you know, it's 300 quid for consultation or, you know, whatever it is, just go in my office. Hi, mate. Have a look at that. <laughs> like, it's so beneficial. You built the team to do it. I built the team to do it, and I've done that on purpose because, obviously, I want to get into land in a, you know, probably over the next five years. We want to start being house developers and builders and something that, DX has grown so quick and the numbers are staggering, but the numbers when you get into land and become a, a Barrett, a Kala or whatever else as well, that's yeah. when it becomes eye-watering generational wealth, which is that, that's, inspiring. That's where I see it could really change my life. Now, my life's so different, you know, from four or five years ago to now, of, of course it is, but because I've got the construction company to build the properties, we'll reduce our costs significantly. Because we've got it all in house, so it's literally just going to be material and labour. That's it. Obviously, we might bring some external things in now and again, but we're going to predominantly have built the team so that when we get a bit of land, we can go and do it all. Well, we can do it all ourselves just now. We do extensions, conservatories, that type of thing. But it's been done in, in purpose because uh, you know we, we know what's going to come. We know what's coming in, in the long game. And one of the things for me, and you know, like you, you asked in, you know, a new build estate. Um, well, I don't in the UK. In the UK, that's where my my main residence is, and like, oh, there's like three types of houses in the in, in the estate. They're all kind of you know similar. But for me, I'm like, I want when I build property or when I build houses for people, they're 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 going to be high spec, because why? Because I can do that at a much cheaper rate than maybe somebody else that's maybe, you know, or can you come and do this? Can, there, there, there's margins getting added on left, right and centre. For me, I'm at cost and labour. That's it. So I'll make sure that when we get to that stage and we are, you know, predominantly building, you know, they're really high-spec properties, which again is only going to force the value You're going to stand up. out from the market again. It's the same template as what you did with DX. You're going to yep. be like, okay, we're going to go in and do things differently and we're going to do it to yep. a higher standard. Yep essentially so um again that's something that i'm you know again it's a long-term goal and long-term vision but certainly something that we were definitely we've got on the horizon because we've got this land secured and we're, we're, we're in cahoots about a few other sites we've covered the from a business perspective but given you're juggling these businesses we've not even spoken about some of the other business interests you've yeah, got the sunbed shop for example which <laughs> always makes me laugh <laughs> but you are operating and you're spinning all these plates I know there's been a bigger focus in recent years on your own personal 
operation yep. system and being an, a quote unquote a high level operator yeah and you actually invested in some coaching in that space as well what did you do yeah so i reckon over the last maybe two or three years um i've probably spent over 100 grand and like personal development you know education like working with private medical practitioners like all of these types of things and you know, I, f- I believe that to, to do it, like for me to do that's an investment in myself, right? I want to be the best possible version of myself, the most success- su- successful, that was easy for me to say, successful version of myself, right? And to do that, you need to be operating at a high level. So like you see online, you know, people got all these mad wacky morning routines and whatever else. People ask me, what's your morning routine? I get in my bed and you know, I go for a shower and I go to work. Like sometimes I'll get up early and I'll go train or whatever else. But I think a lot of people get sucked into that, don't they? Like I think a lot of people think that you need to do that to be this and do that and wh- whatever else. But for me, it's it's certainly been something that I've reaped the rewards, especially my my mentality. Like you know, for example, taking extreme accountability and ownership. I would probably not be that person today if I hadn't spent the money that I've spent on, you know, educating myself and elevating my mindset and getting around these individuals and seeing how they operate and seeing how they work. Because, you know, when I look at myself from the early days, I'm unrecognisable. In fact, I was unrecognisable almost, a year, like, you know, pretty much. You know, it was that light bulb that went off in my head one day and I was like, holy fuck, man, like, I just seen things so different. You're leveling up. And that's leveling up. That's changing. And one of the biggest things that I had to do, and I'm quite open about it, of course, your social circle is one of the most important things that you need to address and you need to look at. And having, you know, conversations with my my business coaches and, you know, whatever else. And, you know, it was always you always hear it from higher people don't you or no higher people like more successful people or like you know your environment's so important for me i'm very selfish now with my environment like i will not spend time with people that are going to suck the life out of me going to be negative going to fucking moan i've not got fucking time for it so you see if you're one of those people i've cut you out my life and you know people listening to this are probably going to understand that because I, I probably have, but my social circle was something that I had to really, you know, look at. You refined it? And I refined it. And what I'd done was, what I'd done was I just looked at, you know, what are, what are certain people doing, right? They're getting sucked, I call it the Glasgow bubble. I mean, you mm. probably know where I'm going to go with this, right? It's the same fucking thing back home, right? They do the same thing. They go to work and they go every fucking weekend. And they get on it and the party and they do this and they do that. And then they go to work, they're depressed, they're fucking chasing themselves left, right and centre. And for me, I, I've never been a big, you know, partier essentially as well. Like now I'm teetotal. I, I don't drink at all. I think in the last year and a half I've you know, had a few cocktails or, you know, at New Year, a celebration yeah, drink or yeah. whatever, right? But for me, it doesn't interest me. Now I can, you know, go down, you know, west beach and you know we can have a good time we are very capable and i would call it sure of ourselves without the boost of alcohol we sat at february 30 had a great time talked to lots of new people talked to our existing friend group and had a great time because yep. we're and i think a period of sobriety actually teaches people to be more comfortable in yourself because you don't have the dutch courage exactly and i, and I think it's like it almost forces you into that's like your your new normal essentially and it's my new normal now like people are like oh how can you go with that and you know off like, you're boring or fucking this and I'm boring. Okay, what the fuck are you doing with your life? Like, do, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm boring. If you think I'm boring, I'm completely fine with that. Because that's a connotation that they've got within themselves. Because what are they fucking doing? They're doing the same fucking shit, living the same fucking life, and they're not going to do anything. That, for me, I've always been different for people. I've, I've always been different from my environment and my surroundings. And listen, that doesn't mean to say people in my social circle that, you know, I used to speak to daily and whatever else that, you know, I fucking hate them. Of, of course I don't. Just not as close. But and you vote just, with your actions. We're just not as close and I just don't need to tolerate certain stuff. Like, I'd be more than happy sitting here saying, I'm, you know, I'm a high value man and I feel like I've got 
the the capacity to be even better than where I'm at just now in terms of business, in terms of personal and, and everything else. And for me, I'm comfortable and confident in saying that because I am. Like, of course I'm. If your habits and your behaviours and actions are in line with your identity as someone who is high value and delivering on the promises that you've made to yourself, yeah, then that's that's true confidence because you're proving yourself over and over again. Yeah, it's enough. And, you know, I always like chatting about the, the whole personal scenario and your social circle and personal development and your mindset because it's so important. Like I said, you know, previously about psychology, I'm very big on that, people's behaviour, how they act and... Yet what you actually start to find is the more successful you become, not the more lonelier you get because I'm not a lonely guy. Yes, I'm, you know, I live here myself and I'm, I'm on my own. I'm pretty fucking comfortable with that. Like I've been, you know, live, I've lived on my own for, you know, quite some time. It, it doesn't bother me, right? Albeit when I was back in the, you know, the UK, my mate was living in my house for about 15 months. So I'm glad you're at, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get my gas Accident back. landlord again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I've always, you know, kind of been used to being on my own as such. Of course, I've had relationships and whatever else, like that's fine. But certainly for me, like being on my own and having my own company, I'm completely fine with that. Like I'll have no qualms in going out for dinner myself. But if you don't, if people will look at that and be like, I fucking weirdo sitting themselves getting fucking food. It happens. Of course it does. But for me, I'm like, you're just on a different planet, let yeah. alone wavelength. You can be selective. When I've been here, we've been out so many times, Mackenzie, other yep. guys that are in the same sort of headspace. Yep. It's been great to connect. But yeah, you don't need to do that every night of the week because you're not trying to fill a void. Exactly. And, and for me, I don't need that satisfaction or that justification. I'm genuinely, I could, you know, get up in the morning, go train myself, go do business, go lie in the sun, go to a beach club, chill out. It, it really doesn't doesn't phase me and i think that says a lot about somebody that can do that in my opinion because you know you have to have that ability to do that first of all stand on your own two feet be independent i've been independent for as a young age but certainly you know like the the whole aspect of like the the, the personal development has changed my life personal development's one thing but you mentioned a medical practitioner that's louise westra that is i yep. want to understand more about the work that you did with her so this came on the back of me actually being hospitalised. Um, it would have been January 23. So completely out of the blue, New Year's resolution, going to start fucking training, we're going to start going to the gym. Um, I was actually in a mastermind at the time, I'm still in them, and it was like, right, let's see you can get a six-pack in three months. One of those ones, right, let's get motivated and keep accountability and, you know, you're waking up at 8 o'clock or 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, people have already been out smashing 10Ks and I'm like, fuck, man, I better get my finger out, right? But it's good accountability. So anyway, January 23, hadn't trained as much as I'd trained in my life, hadn't been eating so good as what I'd ate. Christmas period can be naughty. And Christmas was bad, obviously, and then boom. Woke up one morning, like 3 in the morning, right? And I had never felt pain like this in my stomach. Now, there was no prior, you know, pain, no prior, you know... Warning uh, signs. Warning signs, yeah, something like that. No, no warning signs that this was going to happen. It was just, boom. So I woke up and I'm like, oh, fuck, man, like my stomach, like genuinely. And I've been stabbed, but I can imagine that's what getting stabbed feels like, right? So, st stupidly enough, I'm like, it'll go away and I'm trying to go back to sleep and whatever else. Gets to like maybe, you know... I'm obviously, you know, up during, during the night. It's got to maybe six, seven o'clock. I'm starting to, you know, get messages for, like, the office, the warehouse guy. And I'm like, well, there is no way that I can even fucking look at my phone right now. So I just text Sean and says, I'm really not well. Go to my phone off. Got to go back to sleep. I'll phone you later. That was it. And I woke up at, like, maybe nine, ten o'clock in the morning. And uh, the worst pain imaginable. So I phoned my dad. My dad came, got me, took me straight to the hospital. Um, usual. Ah, oh, you need to wait. Fucking, I'm like bent over in this hospital, mate. Can't move, and they're like, "Yeah, you have to wait." It's waiting times like two hours, and I'm like, "I can't fucking wait." Like I'm in agony. Nah, cool. I, I went and lay my dad's car. I couldn't sit. I wasn't sitting like that fucking <laughs> bent over way, mm. and a waiting room full of people, right? So I've and also it was very uncomfortable to be on my feet and whatever else. So I went and lay in the back of my dad's car. And honestly, that felt like three days that I was lying there. Took me straight. And then obviously about an hour and a half passed, came out of my wheelchair, took me in. That sounds quite dramatic, but within about five minutes of them observing me, 
I had about 10 doctors and nurses in that fucking room with me, right? They thought my bowel had burst, which is, mate, life or death. Genuinely, like, um, my great-grand died because her bowel burst, so I've got, you know, that could have been hereditary or whatever else. So, you know, like, they obviously took blood tests and, you know, is it the, is it the, the infection markers or whatever or okay. something like that? I don't, I don't know the scale, but I, th I think from what I remember, it was, you know, normals, maybe 30, 35. I'm probably going to be corrected on this by some fucking nurse, right? But whatever. There was like 200, say. So it was well over the scale of infection and whatever else. So they were like, right, we need to, you know, get you ready for surgery. We need to do this, do that. So I've started to, you know, freak out a little bit. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? But by this point, the pain's excruciating, right? So then, obviously, they've came in and says, look, we think your bill could potentially have burst, which is pretty fucking serious and i'm like of course that's fucking happened to me like and they were like well, how's your you know diet being how's that and i'm like i've not been training as much as i've trained in my life i've not ate as good as i've ate and you know healthy wise and whatever else so long, long story short i was hospitalized for a week and then when i got out um i missed sean's engagement party so um yeah that was a that was a, a horrible night you know being in there hospitals are fucking terrible right but been in Herr Myers and you know East Kilbride it was not a fun pleasant experience what was wrong with your stomach so again the wonderful NHS didn't actually come to a proper diagnosis believe it or not would, would that surprise you no mm, unfortunately not, would it fuck man so um, they, they were saying oh, it could be this it could be that you know this usual stuff blah blah so when I got discharged you know I was like in the house for a week recovering um and then when I was getting a bit better, I was like, right, I need to do something about that because that's not, you know, that that scared me essentially, right? So I was like, your health's your wealth at the end of the day. Like, if you're not healthy, well, what's the point in life, right? You could you know, be dead tomorrow. So something that I've now started to really keep an eye on and, you know, I have, what have I went and done? I've went and educated myself around certain things. So went private. Of, well, tried to go private, sorry, with my, my, my GP, my doctor, and I'll like, get a referral through, we'll do this, we'll do that, but we need to get this and that for the hospital, and all of it was just a mess, right? It was just taking time, and it was just a pain in the arse. So I've ended up, you know, having a chat with Paul, uh, Paul McFadden. So I'm not even sure how he got into the, the topic of conversation, and he was like, you should, you know, really, you know, look after yourself and do this and do that while having a chat and he was like look I would recommend you speak to Louise she might be able to help you so jump on a call with Louise blah blah so I worked with Louise for like maybe four or five months something like that and wow <laughs> like well she gave you data which I think is something that speaks to the rest of your personality yeah around your hormones and your genetics wasn't it it was basically so working with Louise was great by the way so what, I'd, what we'd basically discovered was we're going to do now, obviously, I just went all out and paid for all these tests, paid for this, that, blah, blah, blah. Give me the full, <laughs> give me the full package, basically. Obviously, we need to send stuff away to the lab. We need to do this, get results in this. But one of the one of the things that we'd spoke about was getting my my DNA right. Now, I had no idea what that meant or what to expect. So I'm like DNA. I'm like, what's that going to fucking tell you? Again, I'm a naive, you know. I'm a naive person at that point because I'm, you know, not really thinking too much about it, but it's not until something like that happens it forces you into having to actually take action on it. So I still wasn't really sure what I was going to get back from it. So I remember um, I just moved into my, my my gaffer here in Dubai. We jump on a call and she was like, okay, I've got your DNA blueprint report pack. I'm um, just going to share my screen. A 35-page document. So I was like looking at this. No, I, fuck, I fucking hated science at school, right? And it just reminded me, like, physics. There was just graphs. There was, you know, red, yellow, green. There was, like, things pointing everywhere. And I was just looking at it. And I was like, Louise, we're going to need to do this in, like, baby steps. Like, I want to really understand this. And she was great. She did. Even, like, the analogy she was using, she was, like, saying, right, this is you playing football. And, you know, this is you turning up to play football and you're playing five asides and, you know, only you's turned up against five people. So the, see, see the way she broke it down? Made me understand things because you need to understand She adapted it. to your understanding of it. Yeah, yeah, basically. And you appreciate so, that. I appreciate that a lot. Um, so one of the, the, the things that we had I actually said to her just before we go any further, I said to her, I says, look, see if you didn't know me as a person, because I kind of got to know Louise a little bit with the circle, the environment with Paul and growth gators and that um, beforehand. Although briefly I said, 
if you didn't know me and you were this was put in your desk and you know you give a report what would you say this person is or describe it and the answer was probably not what i was expecting but i'll share it so she says david if i had to you know describe this without looking at you as a person or if it was just put in my desk and give you an honest overview i would either say the person's a junkie or a highly successful entrepreneur one of the two right one of the extremes so i'm like sorry she's like yeah and i'm like how how the fuck can that be possible like i can assure you i'm not the the, the first part right and the second part well i'll obviously big myself up and say of course and she was like just looking at certain things and then we started to dissect it and we started to go into things and see as she was describing it it was almost as if she was describing how I felt in life about certain scenarios, about certain situations. One of the things that I will say is, I, not in a bad way, but I'm I'm very rarely happy. And what I mean by that is, and not in a pure, I'm sad as fuck, like in terms of like my satisfaction levels, my serotonin levels is what drives satisfaction within your body, right? So basically the way that she described it is like before you generate serotonin, you've got a six foot wall in front of you, right? And you're having to climb over that wall. And then see when you climb over that wall, you've got an army of bandits at the right hand side trying to steal it from you. So when you're generating your serotonin in your body, you're having to get over this big wall, which is a big obstacle. And then you've got, you know, I can't remember the name of it, but... Another group of people another, that are trying to rob you of that. Another group of people that are trying to take it away. So, David, when you're generating your serotonin levels, which ultimately in your body produces satisfaction and fulfillment, yeah, I can see why you're saying that. I can see why you're saying that. And I was like, wow. So, obviously, the next question, what can I do to fix that? So, we talked about several different things. And one of the things that she'd said to me, she says, like, vitamin D is so good for you. And I was like, Okay, well, I'm in Dubai, so <laughs> talk to me. She was like, I want, you to put, I want you to put an hour in your diary per day of you to be in the sunlight, preferably first thing in the morning. And I'm like, not a problem. Wait till I get on the phone and tell Sean that I need to sunbathe for the first hour of the day. <laughs> and we had a laugh about it. And like, yeah, like I, I noticed changes after a week or two. I'm like, wow, right, okay. Not huge and massive changes, of course, but... The, the, just having that education and having that knowledge and having somebody like it was so many times we were on calls together and you know I would share some things with her and you know I would share some personal and private things and we would you know look at things as a, a data perspective and it was just so interesting the data could point to why your body was reacting or your mind was reacting in a particular way to different circumstances. Yep. So my understanding of the the junkie and the entrepreneur side of things <laughs> is if your serotonin and your serotonin or whatever levels are a challenge to maintain and keep, yep. as an entrepreneur, you're always working for the next thing. You're never satisfied. This is we a... did one million, now we do two, now we do 10, now I get land, now yep. I get another house for the portfolio. That's yep. a driver. And some yep. people can't understand how people operate like that. I have many guests in front of me that I'm trying to think, what's pushing that? What's driving that? Yep. Some people are built different internally, and that's how it works. Of course. But I love that Louise equipped you in the same way that I think many people can understand that the body often, sorry, the mind often follows the body. Yeah. So by you course. walking outside in the sunlight, your yep. mind will react differently. Your hormone reaction will mm -hmm. be different. It's a big reason that people have cold showers. It spikes, their, it allows them to create dopamine because dopamine. Yep. dopamine is the the striving for something hormone. It's not necessarily the getting something hormone. So by doing something hard that stimulates you, yep. your body lets off dopamine for hours afterwards. In sharp contrast to Junkie, cocaine has a spiking of dopamine after 12 minutes. Yep. So guess what? The guy chases the next line, the next hit, the next score to get his levels back up. He's chasing <laughs> that. So you can completely understand why yep. I'm just running around chasing profile. the sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you're here. Um, Habibi, come to Dubai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, mate. But nah, listen, it's so true. And like you say, it's like people that are, you know, on drugs or whatever else, like they go chasing that and they keep doing it and they keep doing it. That's me in business. Like, I'm like, okay, we've done a million. Fucking hell, that's unbelievable. Like, I'm I'm really proud of doing that in my first year of business. Next year, over 2.2. .2. Fantastic. Okay, what are we going to do next year? 
tried to get the 4.4, we weren't far off. In fact, uh, the accounts are just been finalised. I think, you know, we're probably there or thereabouts. Um, once it's finalised, we can share that. Um, and then this year, what we're going to do and what we're going to do, like even if I look at my, my property, you know, for an example, something that I've went really, really fucking aggressive with over maybe, actually since I moved here, September. So I reckon, you know, since September... And again, it's all about that, what's next, what's next? You know, we, we bought one, we've done this, okay, and it's like, you just keep going and you keep going, right? So I reckon we bought something like 17 properties since September, and we've had to just go, right, okay, let's just maybe not pause on things, because if an opportunity comes, obviously I'm going to f- fucking do it if I've got the, the bandwidth and the capacity, but never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be able to buy that many properties in that space of time Obviously, there's still some in legals and that are going to be completing pretty soon, right? But I'm like, it's mad. Like, that is, for me, if you were to tell me five years ago you're going to buy 17 properties in how many months that? Nine, ten months, something like that? You're off your fucking head, mate. How have I got the money to do that? And you start to leverage, you start to understand, and you start to educate yourself on how you can raise finance, how you can use funds, how you can refinance, pull funds out, put them into other deals, and... Basically, the, the way that we've been able to do it is we've had everything lined up. Of course, that's came with a few challenges, like everything else. You know, in an ideal world, it would have been money out of that, into that, and you go, it doesn't always happen like that. So we've had to pivot and do things and whatever else. But again, no harm in, you know, sitting here being real about it. That's that's just what happens. Like, I just spent the uh, best part of 70, 80 grand on a refurb. I'm saying 70 or 80 grand because, you know, I know the exact numbers before the fucking leak happened, right? Probably close to 70k. Uh, property's been staged. Marketing's been done. Viewings are scheduled. And then, boom. And is it February? The cold, uh, cold bit of snow. Burst a, 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 main, a cold main in this bungalow. And absolutely obliterated it. And I'm like... Okay. When it rains, it pours. And I, <laughs> fucking literally. So, again, that's my fault. That's, that's my fault. That's my fault it snowed. That's my fault it's, you know, busting my property and whatever else. I'll always just go, okay, it's my fault. I just need to deal with it. Most people would have been like, oh, don't get me wrong, for two minutes there's like fucking snow and whatever else. But, I'm but like, then you realise there's the stimulus, which is the bad event, and then there's the gap for your longer term what's the, response. I'm always uh, you know a big believer in so a wise man once says you know you provide me problems and I'll give you solutions uh, I live by that saying and I live by that in my office we breed that in the office if anybody phones with a problem there's a solution if somebody phones me and says David your you know, house on fire okay cool can you call the fire brigade there's a solution you know so um, when you understand and you think like that uh, it really changes your mind and opens things up yeah, David, this has been an incredible conversation. There's so much still to come with DX. There's a DX Academy, which is going to be working with different trades businesses and unlocking that and using everything that's come from your journey, which people have got to really go in depth on today. And I think we managed to, to yep. go as deep as you've done before. Yeah, no, definitely. I've um, I've been quite open and shared quite a lot. So um, it's been good to chat to you, mate. It was definitely... Um, it was definitely something that I've enjoyed this afternoon. So Brilliant, David. thanks for having me on. Where should people head towards continue the conversation with you? So yeah, if anybody wants to connect with me, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's David T. Stephen. Obviously, you can contact DX Home Improvements Office if it's something that you're inquiring about a refurb or a property deal or whatever else. Um, but yeah, I'm mostly hanging about on Instagram or LinkedIn. So if anybody's want to follow things up and have a chat, definitely reach out. I'm always open to chatting to like-minded people. Brilliant stuff. Both will be linked in the show notes. Thank you to you, David. And thank you to the listener. I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.